number of simulations that uh, I've recently run um, demonstrating that uh, the sodium and potassium content of the moon's exosphere uh, is essentially limited by the impact vaporization rate. And I think the, the scheme that, uh, that I'll present very nicely explains uh, this long-term trends that uh, UBS is observing, uh, as well as previous data by uh, Kaguya. Um, this is an overview um, of the presentation um, from a variety of previous measurements, we think, mainly on scale height uh, arguments that uh, the, the sodium exosphere is mainly populated by photostimulated absorption. But at the same time, uh, we've estimated the rates due to impact vaporization and sputtering, and, and they are a few percent. Um, now, the recent me measurements of sodium ions from, from Kaguya uh, demonstrated uh, a shift, a dawn dusk asymmetry, very slight, uh, just about 10 degrees or so, uh, with the exosphere not peaking at the subsolar point, as would be expected from a photon source acting on an unlimited reservoir. This is really imperceptible, 10 degrees, we wouldn't be able to see it from the ground. Um, so their measurements implied that the reservoir uh, for exospheric sodium is, is really um, rapidly depleted on the day side and must be resupplied by some process, uh, such as meteoroid impacts. Uh, we previously also um, hypothesized ion-enhanced diffusion uh, to be um, a player here. So in this talk, I will present uh, simulations that essentially verify this concept that if you take realistic impact vaporization rates, uh, you could produce, um, you, you let material recycle from impacts, that is the portion that doesn't escape, and then it becomes fair again for a photon stimulated absorption. It turns out you can produce the right order of magnitude uh, for the uh, total amount of sodium and potassium in the uh, exosphere. And I will also discuss uh, in this simulations the role of the soil wind. Is it a source loss? What? Um, this is the original observation, and I think now that we have uh, LADI data, we can look very carefully at uh, how this local time dependence uh, uh, varies. Uh, this is essentially the spacecraft was drip drifting very slowly over a six-month period from dusk to dawn. And you can see here by, uh, I guess you can see, let me enable my pointer. You can see here, for example, uh, there's a signal presumably coming either from the exosphere and or the surface, uh, which shifted by about 10 degrees uh, towards dawn of the subsoil point. Uh, likewise for potassium. Potassium appears to be having more structure, and I think this is uh, consistent with models that we'll show uh, later on. Uh, according to their estimates over here, um, Essentially, depending on how you fitted this uh, this exosphere as a cosine cosine square dependence, uh, about half of the surface reservoir was depleted on the day side, and therefore you must obviously uh, resupply it in some way during uh, night. Um, and that could be impacts, diffusion, and certainly particle migration. That is counting particles that have recycled uh, uh, back to night. Um, so. What we did is build a, uh, a Monte Carlo model of particle transport, which tracks both the exospheric as well as the surface reservoir uh, for this uh, species. Uh, and we ran several models parameterized by poorly constrained parameters, the impact vaporization rate, uh, uh, temperature for the impact vapor, which of course affects uh, recycling, and therefore uh, you know, how much of an atmosphere you can build over this uh, successive rebounds. Uh, and the model essentially relies on micrometeoroids to um, uh, get the uh, sodium that's buried in the subsoil up in the air, and uh, it's only the recycled part that uh, on the extreme set surface, the top angstrom or so, that becomes um, available uh, to PSD. Uh, so the scheme it just tracks flux balance over time, introducing particles, and uh, um, one estimate that we need is essentially the production rates uh, of sodium from impact vaporization. And we've had some uh, a range of uh, possible rates here uh, from the literature before. Um, you see 2 to 3 times 10 to the 4 uh, sodium atoms per square centimeter in second were hypothesized, were estimated really, uh, up until uh, work by Bruno here, 
um, introducing sort of an upper limit of about five times 10 to the four. Uh, and uh, that includes actually the material, the meteoroid itself, the vaporization of the projectiles. Uh, but more recently in a paper by Cremonese, they reanalyzed the uh, Love and Brownlee flux, the, the experiment, and recalibrated the uh, influx uh, at one AU. And they estimated, based on this recalibration, uh, about three times higher uh, potential vaporization rate for sodium. Um, so what I'm going to do in the simulations, or what I did, is essentially uh, assume a rate for impact vaporization. It, it's constant for the time being, and it's um, five times 10 to the four. Uh, per square centimeter in second. Uh, and uh, I vary the temperature, uh, just a Maxwellian uh, velocity distribution function of initial ejecta with something between two and 5,000 Kelvin. And I also allow the uh, cross-section for photon stimulated uh, desorption to vary within an order of magnitude. Um, this is because a range of uh, values was determined experimentally from thin films, and then of course we have porosity, so these are, these are valid numbers that we've used before uh, in analysis. Anyway, when you track this, uh, this system over time now, you see uh, the, the top panel here shows um, two possible exospheres. Uh, the MIV rate is the same. It's, it's uniformly distributed over the entire surface. Uh, but uh, in this panel, uh, I assume a higher PSD yield, which is just outside essentially the range of experimental values. And over here, this is in the middle of the window of, of experimental cross-sections for PSD. And the subsoil point is here in the bullseye, essentially. And this is uh, SS selenocentric ecliptic longitude, essentially. And the terminators are uh, over here. This is Dawn Dots. And uh, so essentially what you see is the uh, shift in the excess you produce is a function of assumed PSD yield. The, excuse me. The higher PSD yields tend to shift this uh, emission towards dawn, and you more rapidly replete, uh, the, deplete the reservoir uh, in that case. Uh, down here, we have the reservoir. Uh, this is uh, log 10 of uh, uh, surface abundance of sodium. Um, and, and it's a few times 10 to the 12, which is essentially what I was assuming in earlier calculations that never bothered about all this in a paper in 2010. And you see the effect over here of polar migration, essentially. Uh, we have, uh, over time, particles migrating to the poles, and that's where most of the reservoir is, uh, whereas the reservoir near the equator is, is depleted. Uh, this is a close-up. Essentially, this is just a slice of the equatorial longitude from midnight to uh, dawn uh, to subsolar to dusk. And you see that um, for two different PSD yields, it looks pretty similar except for the high uh, yield. Uh, the, the reservoir picks at about 70 degrees of the subsoil point or 20 degrees of the um, uh, dawn terminator. Uh, but what affects the actual exospheric peak is how uh, quickly uh, this, uh, this reservoir gets depleted. It gets depleted more quickly um, uh, for higher yield, uh, PSD yield. Um, so let me advance a little bit here. So this is a summary of all sodium models. These are just cuts through the uh, equatorial uh, plane, essentially. Uh, this is just the, um, um, yeah, this is going from um, dawn here. Excuse me. Um, this is dawn, and this is subsolar, and this is dusk uh, terminator. And uh, you see a few profiles. Uh, uh, time shots uh, from the model, and the red is a smooth of, of about 20 uh, independent time shots. You see, of course, that, um, let's see, at the 2,000 Kelvin and uh, PSD yield, which is really at the middle of the experimentally derived parameters. Uh, the expected density that you accumulate with this scheme is about 70 per cc, which is about what we measure from the ground and consistent with LADI measurements. And there is a 10 degree shift uh, of the exosphere towards the subsolar point. This is quite good. Uh, when you assume 5,000 Kelvin um, for the uh, incident vapor, you get about 30 uh, per cc and the same shift. Again, remember that we have a factor of three uncertainty, essentially. Uh, we might assume up to three times this impact vaporization rate. So essentially, independent of temperature, all these schemes work. 
We started with impact vapor, we recycled it, we counted particles until they photoionized, and we still produced the right order of magnitude and shit. So this is an acceptable scheme. Um, now, what is the role of the solar wind? In, in all the simulations I was showing you before, uh, over here, essentially, um, <clears throat> the only thing that was acting on the adsorbed reservoir was um, photostimulated adsorption. So, in addition, we can have uh, sputtering here acting on the adsorbed reservoir with uh, rates or really cross-sections uh, measured by Dukes et al. Uh, on some uh, sodium minerals. Uh, and what they found was that the cross-section for a sputtering of, of adsorbed particles is essentially a couple of orders of magnitude higher than um, the yield, if you wish, of uh, getting material from the subsoil with sputtering. So this is quite efficient. It turns out uh, about 1 in 20 bounces um, uh, results in, in a sputtering event and, and therefore escape. So now you effectively reduce the lifetime of the particles on the surface and the, and the day side and the exosphere. And that leads uh, to reduced abundances that you can accumulate on the day side. Uh, the shift is now about 20 degrees um, off. And that is because you further deplete the reservoir by eliminating uh, uh, particles more efficiently. Uh, last in this third case over here, I've assumed now the soil wind to ask to act both as a source and as a loss. Loss, again, through sputtering of the adsorbed uh, reservoir. Uh, and uh, uh, source as ion enhanced refilling. And I assumed the rate here that I, I thought it would just approximately would double the PSD yield, but I realized that for the most part it just breaks even um, with the um, uh, sputtering. So what you see here is um, an intermediate result effectively. This is without sputtering, this is with sputtering, but with also uh, some ion enhanced diffusion, you see some intermediate results. So, um, the bottom line is that the scheme works, uh, but you have to tune the parameters, the impact vaporization rate, uh, potentially the ion enhanced diffusion. Uh, this term is what would give a time dependent exosphere. In other words, uh, from previous work from the ground, we've inferred that the PSD yield must approximately double as the moon gets exposed to the soil wind. Uh, here uh, we see this with bloody data. The only way to produce this is, is to have a, a stronger ion enhanced refilling than, than assumed here. But what you can produce with just the sputtering losses is a variable hot corona. You would get a brightening of about 10%, it turns out, in this model, uh, by just uh, um, the, uh, the having the sputtering act on the adsorbed reservoir right as the moon uh, enters the magnetosphere again. So you'd get a, a brighter corona. So that's actually consistent with the uh, observations. Um, if you look at the scheme, uh, because all particles over time migrate over the poles over here, uh, if you take a slice of the exospheric abundances uh, uh, with latitude, it's very flat. It's not a cosine model, which is shown here in, in blue, or a cosine square that we observe from the ground. So the result from this is that if the impacts are uniform about the equator, because of particle migration, you essentially do not reproduce the uh, observed dependence with latitude as seen from the ground. So this is a different run over here in which we've assumed uh, the impact vaporization to pick at the equator. And as a test case, I've actually uh, asked it to pick at, uh, at morning, at 6 a.m., as opposed to the uniform impact case, which is here. And you can just about see this is the high PSD yield, which has a, a high shift, a 45 degree shift. But I think you can see if the color scale is helping you, that in this case, the bullseye is more rapidly dropping off now with latitude. Uh, this is exospheric. Uh, this is actually instantaneous PSD rate, uh, flux in terms of uh, atoms per square centimeter in se and, and second. And you can see how this uh, drops off with latitude much uh, quicker. So what I would draw uh, as a, an important conclusion from this is that uh, the sodium dependence with latitude uh, observed from the ground probably necessitates that uh, the micrometeoroid vapor picks up the equator and has a profile reduces um, at, at high latitudes. So let's apply this scheme uh, to potassium. Uh, I've assumed no discontinuities of sodium on the surface. Everything actually that I showed you so far was for uniform impacts. Um, so what would happen if you actually took the lunar cross-spectral map and assumed that the incident uh, 
meteoroids, micrometeoroids were still uniform. You would still produce, though, uh, a time-dependent now vapor and recycling pattern. And uh, we see a snapshot here. Um, this would be uh, exospheric density. Um, I don't remember what the temperature assumed was here. Uh, but you see it gets, the peak gets about to 22 degrees or so. Uh, I'm sorry, 22 per cc, which is approximately what's measured from the ground, maybe 14 per cc. This is the surface reservoir, and you notice the north-south asymmetry uh, because uh, there's a, an enhancement of potassium, obviously, um, on the north in the creep soils. But you see, you notice how uh, this game now produces a, a, a potassium exosphere that has a dependence with uh, um, uh, lunar phase. You see that at full moon, it's shifted by about 20 degrees uh, of the subsolar point towards dawn. But by third quarter, because the creep soils have essentially moved at the dust terminator, um, you get a double bump. And uh, just to conclude, uh, if you actually assume 5,000 Kelvin uh, for potassium, it's actually a much smoother uh, now dependence. You still get a uh, uh, dependence with the lunar phase as you go from essentially it takes a full moon uh, and you see the a shift uh, towards uh, about 10 degrees past uh, the subsoil point, which is what Tony showed, uh, inferred to be the, the peak at uh, potassium. So uh, there's a lot of parameter uh, uh, space to uh, cover here, but the numbers do work. It's just a matter of uh, using some data to tune the model. So these are my conclusions. Uh, it looks like rates of sporadic micrometeoroids suffice to populate the, the PSD exosphere for both sodium and, and potassium. And uh, therefore, we now have a, a mechanism now for connecting dust and, and exosphere, dust and exosphere over time. Uh, I think this provides a very nice explanation of overall uh, trends for sodium uh, and potassium uh, as a function of time. And when dust influx is now cu coupled to soil composition, such as for potassium, this gives a periodically varying exosphere. Uh, and of course, uh, the availability of LADI data uh, allows us to really fine tune these parameters now. Uh, that concludes it. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. And unfortunately, Menelaus, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to go on to the next speaker. But thank you again for your, your uh, fascinating talk. Thank you so much.